if tragedy or sudden change in circumstances, either for you or someone else that you love, has caused you to doubt God, made you feel angry at God, maybe it's left you wondering if there is a God, or if there is a God, is God angry with you? Maybe it's caused you to lose your faith or, or walk away from faith altogether. If tragedy or sudden circumstances, if you've fallen into that category, whether you're in the room right now or online, I understand. I, I, and I don't blame you. And if I were you, maybe that would be me too. I don't know your situation. I don't know what you've gone through. And that's what we're going to talk about today and next week. We're in a series called Under the, the Circumstances. Holding on to God when it appears God is no longer holding on to you. And I want to begin with a statement from the New Testament that is one of the most insensitive statements uttered by anyone. And when I say it, don't get angry at me because I'm just relaying the message, okay? So uh, I'm just the messenger. Jesus is the one who says this. Surprisingly, it comes from the lips of Jesus. And Jesus went out of his way and risked his reputation to create a scenario that would include grief, that would include pain and sickness, that would include betrayal, that would include unbelief and anger. It would include death to assure us that God is aware of what you're going through and God cares about what you're going through. He's with us in it, and he's, he can see us through it. And most of us, this story that I'm going to share, most, a lot of us in the room are familiar with this story, but maybe for some of you, you're not familiar with this story. One of Jesus' friends, like his, somebody that is a, a follower of him, someone that is spurring him on, who's encouraging him, who's, he's one of Jesus' supporters, Somebody that's close to Jesus gets very sick. He gets very sick. His name is Lazarus. And he's so sick that Lazarus' sisters send word to Jesus that he is sick, and they want Jesus to come and see Lazarus. They want Jesus, and they were assuming that once they, because Jesus knows Lazarus, he, Lazarus is a supporter of Jesus, the sisters know Jesus, they're assuming that Jesus would come ASAP as soon as he found out that somebody that is close to him, somebody that he cares about deeply, is unwell. Why do they assume that he would come ASAP? Well, they know that Jesus has healed complete strangers. They know that someone has been healed by Jesus on complete accident. In one incident, Jesus was on his way to heal a girl he'd never even met when a woman touches him, touches his his cloak, his, his clothes, and is healed. And the sisters of his sick friend assume that Jesus will come right away because they've heard stories, they've witnessed, they know what Jesus is capable of, and they have seen it firsthand for people that he hardly knows, and Lazarus is somebody that he knows quite well. But what does Jesus do? Messengers come, word that 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 Lazarus is sick, and Jesus, he stays put for two days. And get this, Lazarus dies. The gospel writer John was there, he, and he wrote this account. And he says that Jesus loved Mary, that Jesus loved Martha, that Jesus loved Lazarus. Why did John include that? Because because if you only know this part of the story, if you only know the part of the story that Jesus let Lazarus die, he didn't take an opportunity to go and heal him, you would probably assume that Jesus was angry with these people, that he was angry with Martha, that he was angry with Lazarus, and that's why he didn't come right away. So John includes that he loved these people. He loved Martha. He loved Mary. He loved Lazarus. And two days later, his disciples are confused when Jesus decides that now is the time to get up and go see Lazarus. 
His disciples are going, why now? Why didn't you go right away? Why go at all? If Jesus, if, if you, the disciples are thinking, Jesus, if you don't remember last time we were there in Bethany, people tried to stone us. Like our lives were in danger. This is what they say. But Rabbi, so Jesus, so let's just paint the picture here for a second in case I've confused you. Lazarus was sick. The sisters sent messengers to Jesus in order to bring Jesus to Lazarus to heal him. Jesus says, not yet. I'm going to stay put for two days. And now Jesus decides that now is the time to go and see Lazarus. Are we all on the same page? And they say, but Rabbi, the disciples, a short while ago, the Judeans there tried to stone you, and yet you are going back? Like, did I hear you right? Why are we doing this? The apostles are thinking, hey, why don't, you know, hi, we, we live in, now we live in a hybrid world. Why don't you just do one of those at-home miracles? Why don't you work at home for the day? We don't need to go to Lazarus. Last time we were in that region, our lives were in danger. So they were far more concerned about their selves than they were about Lazarus. And Jesus replies to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. I love this. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Like, we all know this. When you are sick, you should, you should rest so your body can heal. The disciples were quite literal, thought Jesus was being literal when, they said that, when he said that Lazarus was asleep. But Jesus, just to make it clear, he told them plainly, like, so there's no confusion. Lazarus is dead. I thought you would catch what I was saying when he's asleep. Lazarus is dead. And for your sake... And here it is. I bet John deb debated whether or not he would include this. For your sake, he says. Uh, uh, terms like this are why I am so confident that the, the Bible, that the Gospels is true. Because when you look at historical evidence, when you look at authors or writers of historical documents, if it's make-belief, you do not write yourselves in the story if it's make-believe, you write yourself in the story as the hero. But time and time again in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the writers, they don't write themselves in as the, as the heroes. They are so vulnerable and they've got humility and they write themselves just exactly what happened. And so John includes what Jesus says, for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, again, John was there. I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. Now, how many of you have ever watched Winnie the Pooh? Some hands, got some nods. Eeyore. What's Eeyore known as? Anybody just shout out. Yeah, like he's like, he's one of those sort of downer characters, right? Now, Thomas... Thomas is like the Eeyore of this story. Thomas is like the Eeyore, Eeyore of, this, of this group of people. He says, this is what Thomas says. Now just imagine Eeyore here. Let us also go that we may die with him. <laughs> Let us also go with Jesus. Come on, guys. Like he's the downer of the group. And this isn't going well. And the end is near. And the disciples are confused as to why Jesus wants to go and risk it all for Lazarus when he's already died. Back to Jesus' disturbing statement. I'm glad I was not there. I'm glad that this happened. Let that sink in. I'm glad I wasn't there so that you may believe. Believe what? What is so important to believe that he lets a friend of his suffer and die while his sisters watch? What, is, what sort of belief is so important? And the answer to that question is related to the question of who is you? Who is you? I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. Who is you? And obviously he's referring to the 12, that are, the apostles that are there. But John wrote year, this years after the resurrection of Jesus. This is written years after the resurrection of Jesus. And you refers to you. You refers to me. You 
so that you may believe, so that we all may believe, so that whoever reads this may believe, so that Jesus' 21st century followers may believe. Now, Jesus, get this, Jesus engineered a heartbreaking set of circumstances to address, and I know this has gone through your mind at some point, to address this statement, where's God when we need him circumstances? Jesus engineers a heartbreaking set of circumstances to address our where's God when we need him circumstances. So the, the you, the you are all, the, all of you that don't believe or, or those, of, those of you who used to believe but your circumstances caused you to go off ramp, off ramp of your belief. The you is everybody. And get this, for those of you that don't believe or those of you that used to believe but you don't anymore or you're still trying to work this stuff out, Jesus is about to affirm your feelings when God doesn't seem like he's shown up for you. He's about to affirm what some of you feel right now without condemnation. He understands. Without condemnation. Remember how, how Lazarus' sisters greet Jesus, if you've read this story before? Martha hears Jesus is approaching. Again, this is days after the messengers went to him, and they were expecting him ASAP. So Mar Martha hears Jesus is coming and goes to meet him. He's too late for her brother. He's too, he's too late to, to heal Lazarus. He's too late for the funeral. She's not happy. And she's thinking, after all we've done for you and the gang of 12, you didn't even show up in the time that we needed you most. Can any of you relate? After everything I've done, after all we've been through, you did not show up. You didn't show up when I felt like I needed you most. Martha says to Jesus what maybe you thought about maybe what you've gone through before. Martha says, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Translated to what we might think sometimes. God, this is your fault. This is all your fault. You could have kept this from happening. And this is the moment when Martha's story intersects with your story. If you've ever leveraged tragedy to make the point that God doesn't care or he isn't there, or leveraged disappointment with God and stepped back and said, if there is a loving God, he would have stepped in, so he must not exist. If you've ever done that, it feels like standing on the outside of the faith system and lobbying and criticism. And Jesus knew that. And Jesus went out of his way on this occasion to draw a circle. Jesus drew a circle large enough to include you. You're represented in the story with your doubt, with your criticism and your disappointment and your anger. You're included in the story because you're included in the grand story of God's good news of great joy, not just for a few people, but for all people. Jesus arranged this so that you might believe or that you might believe again. You've You've gone down that ramp off faith and Jesus has included this story so that you might on ramp again to faith. But believe what? I'm glad I wasn't there, Jesus says, so that you might believe. Believe what? After Martha and Mary comes out weeping and unloads her grief and frustration and anger on Jesus like maybe some of you have done. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Judeans had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. 
Now, if you're anything like me, you think, Jesus, if you're going to be deeply moved by this situation, by these circumstances, why not just prevent them in the first place? Why not just, if, if you knew this is going to make people weep and make people cry and you're going to be moved by it, you could have avoided this whole thing. The reader may wonder, why didn't Jesus just go and do this earlier? And then when they led Jesus to the cave where Lazarus was buried, John tells us that Jesus wept. That Jesus wept. Now, your Bibles right now, they're, they're split up into chapters and verses, but when the scriptures were first uh, translated and released, there's no scriptures, there was no chapters, and there's no verses. And so later on, when chapters and verses were put into place, whoever did that decided that this was so powerful that it had to be its own verse. This is the shortest verse in your Bible. That this emotion, that this is, when you're going through those circumstances, when you're like, where is God in all of this? When you're angry, when you're frustrated, when you're grieving, Jesus is right there with you, grieving. Jesus wept. Why? Because Mary and Martha were weeping. Mary and Martha, who blamed and doubted Jesus, were weeping. And he enters into their pain doesn't brush it off and say, oh, don't worry, watch this. Enters into their pain, enters into their frustration, enters into their loss, enters into their grief. He enters into it, and then witnessing Jesus' grief, one group of people said, see how Jesus loved Lazarus? See how much he loved Lazarus? And one group, the other group of people weren't so sure. They would think, he, he healed a blind young man. Surely he could have showed up in the right time and saved his friend from dying. And that's all true. But Jesus had a bigger agenda at play. He had a bigger agenda in mind. He had you in mind and me in mind and all of us who are sitting in this room and watching online, everyone in this world, he had everyone who would read this in mind. And then Jesus steps up and does the unthinkable. He says, remove the stone. Remove the stone where Lazarus is laying. Move the stone. Now, this isn't just something where, you know, someone can just get their finger and... No, this is a big ordeal to move the stone. It's a heavy stone. You couldn't just have one person push it with their finger. And then Martha, on top of that, reminds, Martha reminds Jesus of the stench that would come from the tomb. Lazarus has been there in four days. Martha says, by this time, there's a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Like, the body is decomposing. Jesus, you're too late. Why would we open, why would we open the rock? Lord, you're four days late. Then, this is my favorite part. Jesus begins to pray out loud so that everybody can hear his prayer. He doesn't pray inside. He doesn't, you know, close his eyes, fold his hands, and just stands there awkwardly not saying anything. He, he prays out loud, and it says, Jesus looked up and said, Father, thank you that you have heard me. Thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here and for the benefit of someone sitting here, for the people that are navigating circumstances that are crushing you or have crushed your faith, those that are too hard and too heavy, and you're wondering if God cares or hears your prayers. You wonder if you're being punished, or maybe this is all fiction. Maybe this is all once upon a time story writing. He says this prayer out loud for you to hear. that they may believe, here it is again. Believe what? I, he, remember he says, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. 
And here it is again that they may believe that you sent me. That you sent me. So this entire engineered tragedy was about who sent Jesus? Yeah. Was it worth it? Yes. If the Father sent the Son to show us what the Father is like, then you can be rest assured that the Father weeps with you in your pain and sorrow because he cares for you. He doesn't condemn you even when you doubt or lash out at him or you're angry with him. There's no condemnation. If the Father is like the Son and sent him to represent the Father, you can know that circumstances are not an indicator of God's absence or silence. If the, father, if the Father sent the Son to demonstrate what the Father can do, then there's hope. There's hope regardless of the circumstances. So Jesus takes a deep breath. Sometimes we just have to take a deep breath, don't we? And he calls out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out with boldness and faith. Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. And I'm confident that some people there passed out. (laughs) I probably would have passed out. After seeing this, therefore, many of the Judeans who had come to visit Mary had seen what Jesus did. They believed in him. Therefore, many of the Judeans who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. What did they believe? They believed that Jesus was sent by God the Father and then what he said can be trusted. If the Father is like the Son, there is hope. Back to this statement. I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. Jesus included us in that story so that we can face tomorrow knowing he's part of our story. Whatever circumstance you're going through, maybe it's something that's current or maybe that's something that's been lingering with you for a long time. We can face tomorrow knowing that he is part of our story. I'm glad he wasn't there because now we know that circumstances are not an indicator of God's absence. That whatever circumstance you're going through, that is not an indicator of God's absence or lack of concern. If the son's empathy, compassion, and concern reflect the father's empathy, compassion, and concern, then Peter was right when he instructed first century Christians. He says this, humble yourselves, therefore under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time and cast all your, this is the Greek word, and it it normally says cast all your fears, but it's so much, so much in that it's, you can cast all your anxieties, all your worries, all your cares, all your concerns. You can cast all of these things on him. Why? Because he cares for you. He cares for you. He cares for you. Some of you just need to hear that, that he cares for you. Now, I know that might be easy for me to say, I'm not in your shoes. I'm not going through what you're going through. I haven't heard your story So I don't want to sound insensitive to what you're going through. But I've experienced some of this. I've walked with people who have experienced this, journeyed with people who have gone through tremendous circumstances. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're facing, whatever you're navigating, Whatever you're feeling stuck with or stuck in, 
when you feel like you have no solutions or you have no other options, God has not abandoned you. God has not left you. God is not ignoring you. God is not condemning you. God is not saying, how dare you have doubt? How dare you be angry at me? No. God is by your side weeping. He is in it with you and wants to journey with it with you. Wants to help you get through it with you, not to leave you alone. Jesus went out of his way to demonstrate and punctuate that very thing. That you are invited or invited back to cast all your care, all your grief, all your sorrow on him. Knowing that he cares for you, knowing that that's not falling on deaf ears, knowing that he's not ignoring you. Why? Because God sent his son to illustrate and demonstrate that for us. That's where peace is found. And that's where grace is experienced. That's when you learn you can hold on to God when it appears that God's not holding on to you. But church, God is always holding on to you. He has not left you. He has not left your side. He cares for you deeply, and he invites you to cast all of your cares, your worries, your anxieties onto him. And we'll pick it up there next time in part two of our series, Under Current Circumstances, holding on to God when it appears God is no longer holding on to you. God, we thank you for Jesus, that he illustrates and demonstrates what you're like and takes some of the mystery out about who you are. God, I don't know what everyone's going through. I don't know all the circumstances. I don't know what people are carrying in their hearts, but I do know that you don't want them to carry it alone, that you want to be by their side, walking with them, that, and they, you want us to cast those things onto you so that you can lighten the load for us. God, make your presence known this week. And for those, of, for those of us, for those of you that have stepped back from faith, have left faith because you thought there's no way a good God could allow this to happen, God, I pray those people would be reminded of your grace, would be reminded of your forgiveness, and would be reminded of your compassion and how much you deeply care for each and every one of us. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.